Welcome to this channel and before we continue I will kindly request you to subscribe to this channel and also hit the notification bell so that whenever we upload a new video you are notified. Today we will continue with the GAD uh, project analysis. A massive dam that is being constructed in Ethiopia, the Grand Renaissance Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, a dam that will be largest HEP production facility in Africa and seventh in the world. The dam is meant to produce power which Ethiopia needs to fuel its economic development. So with this dam there are several lessons that can be learned despite the opposition that this dam has received from with Egypt and uh, Sudan as, as well as environmental uh, activists there's lessons that can be learned from this dam especially by African countries and they can learn these lessons and apply them in their project or in their uh, running of their affairs so the first lesson that can be learned from this is on colonial treaties that have continued to hold African uh, hostage mainly the Nile treaties. So Africa has been bogged down by a number of treaties that were signed by the colonizers on behalf of these colonies. A number of these treaties were signed by Great Britain on behalf of the colonies in Eastern Africa. So those, through these treaties, especially the Nile water treaties, uh, the upstream countries in the Nile, in the Nile Basin cannot utilize the resources of River Nile up to now. These treaties of 1902, 1929, 1959, they all disregarded the upstream countries. It's as if people in these countries never existed. Ethiopia and also other upstream countries are challenging these treaties. And they have shown the way. And this is the way that all other African countries should follow. More treaties that have heavily impacted on development of Africa, including the creation of boundaries or borders by the colonizers, should be disregarded and challenged. This situation is well captured in a book by Edem Kojo, a book called African Tomorrow, where he describes the condition of Africa as, and I quote, torn away from his past, propelled into a universe fashioned from outside that suppresses his values and unfounded by a cultural innovation that marginalizes Africa. End of quote. So these are situations that need to be changed and can only be changed by Africans themselves. And Ethiopia and uh, other Nile Basin initiative countries are leading the way. The second lesson is for Egypt to learn. Egypt needs to explore alternative sources of water. So they need to rethink about the sources of water and entirely depending on River Nile. 98% of water that is used in Egypt comes from River Nile, a single source. If something was to happen to River Nile, Egypt would suffer. Given the climate change and also the drive by the Nile Basin uh, initiative countries, especially the upstream, upstream countries to use the water of River Nile, there's likely that the amount of water that flows uh, in River Nile can reduce. And if this happens, Egypt can suffer. So Egypt needs to explore other sources of water. And one question that keeps on uh, being asked is whether the country has been looking for other sources uh, given this possibility of climate change or anything happening to River Nile. So they need to pay more attention to water use. They need to realize that every drop counts and they should reduce water loss to the minimum. So other water sources that can be explored and indeed there are some reports that Egypt is doing this is desalination. Although it's very expensive, they need to explore these 
uh, option because it can solve uh, their problems especially uh, domestic water problems and uh, it's promising this this option is promising for egypt but it, it might end up spending a lot of money but justified because to water problem in egypt is egypt keep on keeps on saying that uh, water problem is extent uh, I mean can affect the existence of the country so they need to explore other sources of water so that they don't entirely depend on one source and if this river is so important to this country and we all know that it is Egypt need to stop its bullying tactics they need to come and negotiate with the uh, Nile Basin countries and reach an amicable solution Actually, Egypt needs these countries more than it needs them. I mean, Egypt needs these Nile Basin initiative countries more than they need it. Because they are depending on River Nile, and River Nile comes from these countries. So they need to come to the table and negotiate and agree on how to share this important resource. And they stop using those bullying tactics. The third lesson from this project is on um, unbalanced and unfair agreements which has been signed, uh, especially the Nile treaties. So time for this kind of uh, agreements is over and uh, we are in a new world dispensation where countries are, or states are mutually agreeing on various issues. When you look at most agreements which have been signed, especially between the strong and uh, weak nations or states they are unfair and they give some countries more advantage than others or they, they get more opportunities than others and this puts some countries into some risk and this is what the Nero treaties have done so these wrongs need to be uh, corrected where states need to enter into agreements that are mutually beneficial. When you look at the history of water use in Nile Basin, it has been riddled with uh, biasness, where one-sided colonial treaties and agreements between colonial powers and their protectorates have been made. Look at the 1981 treaties that were made uh, between the colonial powers, especially the United Kingdom. United Kingdom entering into this agreement with Egypt was not meant to help Egypt. Actually, it was meant to benefit the United Kingdom because it had some massive uh, cotton plantations in this country and they needed to feed or they needed some raw materials to, uh, to support their textile industries back at home. So they had to do anything possible to ensure that water of river nile is is not is, is remains and they don't suffer water shortages so that they can keep on uh, supporting these cotton plantations and keep on feeding their country or uh, their textile industries back at home so other treaties 1902 treaty or agreement was one-sided uh, and this treaty has been quoted several times as binding ethiopia uh, especially when it comes to construction of projects along the Blue River Nile. But Egypt, um, I mean Ethiopia, has been uh, very strong on this, arguing that they are not bound by that treaty, especially when it comes to construction of uh, projects that are uh, beneficial to the public. E Ethiopia argues that that treaty between, uh, which was signed by Emperor Menelik II, the King of Kings of Ethiopia, did not bind Ethiopia from constructing uh, projects along Blue River Nile. What it did is that it prohibited the country of Ethiopia from totally, uh, I mean, obstructing the water of River Nile such that the downstream countries uh, would suffer some uh, consequences out of it. Talk of 1929 treaties, 1959 treaties, these were one sided. They disregarded the interest of upstream countries. For example, the 1959 treaty where Egypt and uh, Sudan allocated themselves the whole of River Nile. 
without any regard to upstream countries. So upstream countries, according to this treaty, are not supposed to use the resources of River Nile. Uh, so these treaties did not take into consideration some interest of uh, upstream countries. And uh, this has led to a uh, formation of Nile Basin Initiative. And they have come up with a cooperative framework agreement where some, uh, some countries have signed and ratified, but Sudan and Egypt have, received, have refused to sign and uh, ratify the, the agreement because it, uh, this agreement uh, do, does away with these unbalanced and unfair agreements of Nile and brings in a new uh, dispensation which promotes equitable sharing of resources of River Nile. The fourth lesson is on uh, patriotism and nationalism that this project is talking in uh, Ethiopia. So completion of God will make the current Ethiopian generation the patriot of modern era. So God has been serving as a patriotic aspiration and national pride drawing all walks of life together for its realization. So Ethiopians feel that it is their duty to fully complete it for the sake of their children and also the future generation. So by fully completing this project, they are calling themselves the heroes of today. And their children and also the future generation will come to recognize this and they will be very proud of this generation. So realizing the guard would be a golden opportunity for all Ethiopians across the nation and beyond uh, to come together for the purposes of national unity, peace and prosperity. So Ethiopians are being urged to act as good ambassadors of their country with a view to protect its national interest and also transform Ethiopia which has a very rich history and it has been a center of ancient uh, civilization. With the second feeling coming, which is scheduled for July and August uh, in 2021, there are strong campaigns, both online and offline, where people are being rallied uh, for full support of this dam. And also, uh, indeed, the Ethiopian nation. So the overall construction of this dam is seen as a symbol of national unity, and economic growth. Although there are some issues with the, uh, in the country, especially the conflict in some areas such as Tigray and uh, Romia, uh, the kind of nationalism and uh, patriotism that this has drawn is something to think about, something that other countries can emulate. However, Ethiopia need to address uh, some of the issues that are arising that probably uh, may derail the support of this project, especially at home. The conflict in Tigray and Oromia regions, that question need to be answered and solution need to be found. And also there is a need to tone down the ethno-nationalism uh, sentiments that are gaining ground in different parts of country. And also it is important that they address the excesses that have been reported uh, in various quarters. Another important lesson that, ca is, that comes out of this project is the unique funding model that Ethiopia used. So this project needed 5 billion US dollars. This is a huge amount of money. Actually in 2016 it was 7% of the Ethiopian uh, gross national product. So given that this project was receiving some opposition uh, from various quarters. Ethiopia uh, decided that they will not borrow from uh, international financial institutions. Actually, there are some records that World Bank uh, refused to fund the project given the kind of opposition that it was receiving and also the uh, envir environmental impacts it was likely to have, especially in downstream countries. So Ethiopia looked for an alternative way of financing this project. It opted for crown funding through internal fundraising and also issuance of an infrastructure bond, as well as persuading its uh, people and also 
mainly employees to contribute their uh, portion of their incomes. Ethiopians abroad and also at home contributed the first $350 million dollars, US dollars with government workers contributing amounts which were equivalent to their monthly pay. Uh, this was successful but there were people who were skeptic especially uh, on uh, because the country was facing some uh, issues especially corruption so some people felt that this was not the best way to raise money given the level of corruption that uh, has been there or was there in the country at that time other funds were borrowed from uh, Chinese government which provided a significant amount of international finance especially for the hydro uh, power infrastructure there are also some claims that Ethiopia approached uh, friendly Gulf states to contribute to the construction of this dam along the Middle East political line, especially with respect to the relations with uh, Egypt. So it approached uh, Gulf states which do not have a very good relationship uh, with uh, Egypt. Um, so uh, this project has had a very unique funding model and uh, the fact that it has reached 80 percent in terms of its completion shows that this model was successful and other African countries can borrow from this. There are some African countries which are bogged down by sanctions and uh, some other uh, problems and uh, it makes them very it makes it very hard for them to get funding for some projects especially projects which are very important for their economic development so african countries can borrow from this model and try to uh, stock some uh, patriotism and also uh, convince people that and also show people that they are going to use this money uh, well without any issues uh, another lesson uh, that can be learned from this is on the uh, location of the dam and also bringing people or forcing people into negotiation. So regarding the location of this dam, it is thought that this was done uh, strategically by design. So remember that this dam is located 40 kilometers away from Sudan border. Ethiopia could have found, I mean could have gotten a better alternative uh, sites for this project, but they decided to construct it near the Sudan's border. So there are some reports that this was done by design so that they bring the Egypt and uh, Sudan into the table. If anything was to happen that they don't agree and uh, probably these countries go into war, if the, if the dam is bombed, it will not harm the Ethiopians, it will harm the countries downstream. So this, this, this regards the dam. So those are the lessons that uh, can be learned from this dam. And African countries can emulate. So welcome for more uh, future videos on these and other topics. Thank you.